wind and there's sand, and there's not much in between. But now I can stand in this beam of liquid sunshine. He said, where well, I'm from, water's hard to find, and you're looking at me like I'm out of my mind. But every time that it rains, it's a town that reminds me to be thankful for what I am. I just don't get what's so great about being well. I don't think I ever will forget what he said in reply. He said, Why waste your time on things you cannot change? Those clouds in the sky, they won't be dried up by your age. So you can see why I like to soak up liquid sunshine. That's what he said. Let's get wet. Otherwise, we're going to leave after the next 40 minutes or so, 
having become a lot richer in our appreciation of music in this world, right? Who's going first? <laughs> idea that there is just so much music out there. I mean, if you look at Spotify or Apple Music or Tidal or, Tidal or Deezer or any of the other streaming music services, do you know how many songs are available? About 55 million. Uh, Spotify is adding 1.2 million tracks a month. About 20% of all the songs in the Spotify universe have not been heard by human ears once. In fact, if you, yeah, twenty percent. If you if you have a Spotify account, you can log on to a uh, an app called Forgotify, <laughs> <laughs> and Forgotify will provide you with a stream of songs from the Spotify universe that have never been streamed once. <laughs> it is really cool. The problem is is that the when you listen to it at one time. It'll never be heard again. <laughs> so the issue is with, with uh, there's just so much music, there's too much music, we can't keep up. We are all about, you know, okay, this is good, but uh, what else is everybody listening to? There's probably something better than this, so I've got to keep hunting, 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 with very little gathering. Vinyl, and to a certain extent CDs, provides us with an opportunity to gather. And there is something to be said, well, let's just break it down a little bit. With streaming, you have an awesome opportunity to audition basically the whole of human history when it comes to music. And your, your investment is 10 bucks a month, or maybe even nothing if you go with a free tier. And, but there is something to be said for a carefully curated collection of music that means the most to you. And that is hearkening back to this idea uh, before the internet where we used to demonstrate our love of music by the number of linear feet our music collections took on, <laughs> right? So a lot of people are getting into this idea of I want to have this for my very own that I can go back to again and again and again with no additional charge. Plus I have a booklet or artwork or liner notes or all of the above that I can ponder over and maybe let my imagination run wild as to what the artist meant or what, what the artist was thinking. Uh, the other thing about vinyl is that it is a demonstration to everybody out there that says, see how much I like music, how much I love music? I am willing to put up with such an inconvenient format <laughs> that is not portable, that is very fragile, and that I actually have to get up and walk across the room to change it. Well, they do, but that's not the point. The point is that I love music so much that I am willing to sacrifice convenience in my listening habits. And that's okay, too, uh, because there is something to be said about the ritual of vinyl. It's, you know, it has a smell, it has a feel. Um, you wrap it from the shrink wrap and you open up the album and you put it on the turntable and you put the needle down and then you go back and you have to sit and wait for our songs to come up. Oh, I don't like this song. That's too much trouble to get up and go and walk across the room. So I'm going to let that song play every time I put it on the album, even though I don't like it at first, but maybe if I hear it four or five times, I kind of like the record. And you know what? That's kind of good because I paid money for this and I wouldn't want to admit to myself that a couple of songs on this record aren't very good because that means I kind of uh, wasted my money because, you know, that's what it is. It, it, it's, it's ritual, it's tactile, it's primitive, and it's just fun. You know, people collect shit. <laughs> and whether it be stamps or spoons or, or uh, you know, uh, beanie babies or my mom's dumb humble figurines, uh, it's just a cool to have something that is yours, that is personally curated and completely dedicated to you. Does that make sense? And when you buy a record, you or buy a CD, you 
are buying the privilege of listening to that piece of music an infinite number of times for as long as you're alive. So you have, that's why you pay $1.29 for a digital download. That's why you pay you know, $20 for an album, because you now own that physical piece. And you'll never get charged again. Make sense? So good question. Next. <laughs> yes. No more dealing with these stupid record stores that may or may not pay their bills and go out of business before they've had a chance to pay you. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we have to find ways to adapt to this new world. And it's very, very difficult for musicians uh, and all, all musicians. This is a really complicated answer. I'm just trying to think of where to start. Uh, with working musicians today, it's, it's miserable because they aren't going to sell any records, which is where you have your greatest profit margins. They have to play live more often, and that's getting difficult because there's so many musicians out there that need to play live and only so many places to play. Vancouver is horrible for venues because so many of them have closed down. I was talking to Matthew Good a little bit a little while ago, and he's 
laments that, you know, if I was starting out today, I wouldn't know where to fight because I'd have to go out to Surrey or I'd have to go out to Richmond. There's nothing in Vancouver proper because of gentrification and, and, and uh, redevelopment. Um, so it's, musicians today are in a very difficult position. But let's peel it back a little bit more. Spotify, Apple Music, Teaser, Tidal, all the rest of them aren't being mean in the sense that they're not paying out what they pay because they're greedy and they don't want to pay out anymore. Spotify and all the streaming music services have to negotiate with the rights holders of the music. And in most cases, these are record labels. And the record labels grind the streaming music services down to uh, what they, or well, actually grind them up to what they have to pay. So it's all negotiated. Everything is all negotiated and comes up for renegotiation after every three years or something. So what Spotify and the other services pay is what the labels tell them to pay, what they negotiate to pay. Uh, so what happens is that the money from Spotify goes into this big black box that are the record labels. And then the record labels pay out what they think the artists deserve. Now you would think that the people in charge of that big, block, big black box middle would have the best interest of the artist in mind. Well, they don't. Because they're looking to make as much money as possible, and if that comes in the backs of the artists, well, that's the music business. That's the way it's always been done. It works like this. If you work for two weeks, and you have direct deposit at your bank, and then you go expecting to be paid X amount because you know how many hours you worked, or in the case of a musician, you know how many streams you've had, and then the bank says, we're going to give you this much because we think that's what you deserve. That's basically what's happening. So it's, you, we have to be very careful when we start blaming the streaming music services for, for paying out very little, is because there's this black box in the middle that's really screwing the artists. And what you don't hear about is that the uh, record labels have equity positions in a lot of the streaming music services. So they're playing both ends against the middle on this one. Um, it also explains why we see an awful lot of legacy artists like Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles and ACDC and Aerosmith and all these other groups still on the road. Why are they still touring? Well, it used to be, I'll give you an example, the Doors broke up in 1973, but for decades, they could be expected to sell a million copies of each and every one of their albums every single year. So the surviving members of the Doors would go to their mailbox every six months, they would see a check, and it would be nice and fat, and basically it was like an annuity. They were getting money, and they were okay for the rest of their lives. Internet comes along and all of a sudden people stop buying records and those checks get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have a lot of artists who either want to you know, have estate planning for their heirs or they've got a lifestyle that they have to support with houses and ranches and vineyards and all that sort of stuff. Or they completely wasted all their money on sex, drugs and rock and roll and are like David Crosby who's 77 years old and still has a mortgage on his ranch and he has to go out on tour. This is why they have to play live so much because the checks for the old records aren't what they used to be. Um, so we're gonna see these guys in their, and, and women, in their 60s and 70s and even their 80s touring because that's the only place they're gonna get money. They're not getting it from sex anymore and they're not getting it from streams because streams tend to be something that focuses on rap, hip hop, and R&B. If you look at the top 200 streams uh, charts every week, as I do, you'll never find a rock song, you'll never find a country song. It's all hip hop, R&B, pop, and uh, rap. Uh, am I explaining? Yeah. So, and the other thing too is that people have a misconception that a stream is equal to a sale, and it's not. Here's an example. If I play a song on the radio once, that song is heard by 100,000 people, right? So your song, one play, gets heard by 100,000 people. We have to play, pay something called performing, art, or performing rights fees in Canada, and just about every other territory around the planet has to play uh, a fee for the privilege of playing music on the radio. You'll get somewhere around a tenth of a cent or maybe five one hundredths of a cent for that one play, but it, you reached 100,000 people. That's what the artist will earn. If it's streaming, you'll earn about the same amount of money if you have 
100,000 people listen once. It's the same thing. The math is exactly the same. So you can't equate a stream with a sale. It's apples and oranges. However, there are no sales. So we have to worry about where musicians' income is going to come from. And we haven't quite figured that out yet. Because right now we have a layer of superstars at the top, and then a huge layer of struggling musicians at the bottom, and no middle class. And that is unsustainable. So the best thing that you can do, to get back to your original question, is when you go to a gig, buy some merch. And if you buy a CD, chances are that will be equal to about 50,000 streams. Yes? Um, you said earlier that the big black box pays the artists what they feel the artists are worth. Based on the contracts that they sign with the artists, yes. That would be on the follow up, is it just based on contracts? Yes. So it could be a set amount, or could it vary at all? Well, it depends. Uh, it depends on the artist, it depends on the age of the contract, it depends on a whole bunch of things. Uh, for example, a lot of contracts still have breakage um, clauses. So in the old days, you know, a certain number of records would fall off a truck and break. Why is there a breakage clause <laughs> when you're dealing with zeros and ones transmitted over the internet? That's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with. And a lot of these contracts are completely impenetrable and you know, a young kid or a young band signs a deal, they're just too happy to sign it, they don't have enough money for a proper lawyer to go through it line by line, and they get screwed. The other issue too is that uh, most contracts these days, new, new contracts these days are called 360 deals. So that means the record label not only gets a piece of the action of the music that is sold, but also the touring, and also the merch, and also everything else the band does. Now this is good and bad. It's bad in the sense that the label takes more money away from the artist, but it's good in the sense that the artist, or the label now has a, uh, a greater interest in every aspect of the artist's career succeeding. So they will try harder to make that artist a success uh, based on all these other parameters and variables rather than just sales. So it's good, it's, good, it's bad, it depends. Yes? Um, I feel like a lot of the conversations we have about music these days is, is this one about like how technology is disrupting Conversation, yes. or is it is? It, it, there hasn't been other technological developments in music. Well, have... I did a TEDx uh, presentation in Winnipeg last month, and I talked about containers. Uh, up until the phonograph and the gramophone came along, music was amorphous; it couldn't be stored for later analysis and study and enjoyment. But and songs could be as long as they needed to be. Uh, for example. Um, you know, it could be a quick folk ditty that went on for a minute and it was done. Uh, a folk ballad could go on until the story was done. A symphony orchestra could play a, a symphony that could be an hour or more. The Greek national anthem has 158 verses. Wagner's <laughs> <laughs> operas are three days old. Well, there you go. So the, the issue became when we had, first of all, the cylinder from uh, Edison, which could only hold two minutes. Well, the container for pre-recorded music could only be two minutes. So we began to get used to the idea of a certain length for songs. So with the cylinder, it was two minutes. With the 10-inch uh, 78 RPM record, it was about three and a half minutes. The 78 RPM record was around for 50 years, and that basically standardized the length of a popular song, three and a half to four minutes. Um, now, the container that music comes in is infinite because there is no container with the internet. It can be as long or as short as, as as necessary. However, we need to look at what the streaming music has done to our consumption patterns. First thing that you need to know is that when a song is streamed, there is no payout to the artist or the rights holders unless that song has elapsed for 31 seconds. You've got to get past at least 30 seconds before you get paid. So now the game has become, how do we keep people listening to a song for at least 31 seconds? And producers and composers and artists and managers and record labels are all trying to game us, trying to manipulate us into making sure that we listen for at least 31 seconds. And we have statistics to back that up. 
Spotify has a company behind it called the Echo Nest, and the Echo Nest is always crunching the big data that is generated by people listening to the platform. We know this. 25% of Spotify listeners will skip a song in the first five seconds. 29% will skip a song in the first 10 seconds. And 35% will skip a song before it's 30 seconds old. Therefore, the game becomes, how do we get people to stop skipping before the 31 second mark? And you can see it happening. Uh, shorter intros, the chorus up front, multiple hooks in that first 30 seconds, anything to give us some kind of musical sugar high to drag us through that 30 seconds. Best example that we have currently is the new Taylor Swift song, Me. Listen to that first 30 seconds and you'll see how it drags you from the, you know, the first thing she says is me, and then there's a series of hooks and we finally get to the chorus and it's all before 30 seconds is out. So this is changing the nature of, dis of, of the musical distribution and the way we are consuming it and our attitude to the fact that, uh, regarding the fact that there is too much music out there and we haven't got time to listen to bad songs or songs that don't um, appeal to us right away. So we're being manipulated. And that was the whole gist of my, my TEDx talk, is that, listen, leave the skip button alone. You know, be in the music, enjoy it, and try to find something in whatever you're listening to for its goodness and artistic value. Um, yes? Uh, probably like a lot of people, my memories are associated with music and affiliated directly with not just songs, but the order in which they're played, which touches on a lot of the conversation tonight, and it's the order of albums. Yes. And now we don't have that, well, we do have it, but no one listens to it. They listen to the singles because of everything we've talked about. What's the impact going to be on people's memories? Well, here's, the, okay, the issue is that we used it for, from about 1965, I mean, there were albums before then. The album was introduced in 1948. But from about, for, for popular music, albums really became the container, the palette for artists who were into popular music. And they agonized over the sequencing of song on the album. And it was supposed to be listened to in toto uh, because that was the artist's statement. That's how they wanted you to appreciate their artistic work. Albums right now are, are dying because it all it all began with spot, uh, with uh, with iTunes, with Steve Jobs went to the record labels and said, "You guys are dying because of piracy. I'm going to save you by creating this online music store. But for this online music store to work, we have to sell songs a la carte, one by one. No more of this business about spending sixteen ninety nine for an album um, because you have no choice. I just want these individual songs." So from 2003, which is when the iTunes store was first introduced, people began to get used to this idea of, of buying music or consuming music like a Chinese menu. You know, you would go, you know, here's your rice dish, here's your meat dish, here's your noodle dish, here's your dessert, whatever. And that's not going away. It's very difficult for an artist to put out an album right now because if you look at streaming, and again, we have to keep going back to this because that's the dominant form of music consumption these days. You'll see that the singles get streams, but the deep album tracks do not. So if I'm a, a band, I mean, what's the point of recording a full album anymore? Paying for it. Yeah, and paying for it, and just seeing that nobody's going to hear this music except my diehard fans. Hip hop is tends to be a little bit ahead of the curve on a lot of this stuff because what hip hop artists are doing is they're releasing songs that uh, they're releasing. EPs with six, seven, eight tracks on them, and the whole thing's over in 20 minutes. Um, there's something really insidious about Lil Nas X and Old Town Road. Okay? The song is a minute and 57 seconds long. And because it's a minute and 57 seconds long, you don't really, it's over before you know it, right? It takes a lot, and because it, it's gone by so quickly, you don't have a chance to really get sick of it as quickly as you would if the song was four minutes long, right? So, uh, and then there's multiple remixes of it, which are slightly different, which gives you a different flavor to each of the songs. And uh, are we ever gonna hear another song from Lil Nas X uh, as big as this? Probably not. I mean, what's it, 15 weeks now that it's been number one in, on the Billboard charts. Um, and hip hop, people understand a couple of things. First of all, if you have a shorter song, 
the chances of people skipping it are less. They found that out. And the other thing is, if you have a bunch of short songs, you cycle through these out these songs much more quickly than you would, for example, a, a Tool album, which has five, ten minute songs on it. <laughs> so which makes more money for the artist? It's the EP with short songs. And Tool, you know, God bless them, they got, you, you know, for them to make another, you know, five one hundredths of a cent, you gotta wait 10 minutes, right? <laughs> but if you have somebody like uh, you know, Chris Brown, for example, released an album um, earlier this year with 45 songs on it. And it went all the way up the charts because the songs were so short that people cycled through them. And when you take into account the statistics involving streaming and how it's weighted on the charts, it just went up the charts. And it was a successful album, but there were no hit singles on it. But because of the virtue of, of the number of songs that were streamed, it went up the charts. There's another band from, from the UK, they're called the Pocket Gods, and they've got it figured out. Earlier this year, they released an album called 300 by 30. 298 songs, none of them longer than 42 seconds. <laughs> it's brilliant, really. Uh, because again, every 42 seconds max, they would make another five tenths. And there's 298, uh, 296, 298 songs, whatever it was, and they would make a ton of money doing that. Then there was another band called Wolfpack. Oh, oh they're clever. So what they did was they released a, a 10 song album each of the tracks was 31 seconds, but each of the tracks were dead silent. There was no music, there was no audio whatsoever. But it was in, what they did was they recorded dead silence, uploaded that into Spotify, and told their fans, go listen to our album, put it on overnight on repeat. And every 30 seconds, we get paid. And Wolfpack made $20,000 before Spotify said, cut it out. And it was enough money for them to finance it to them and buy a new van. So again, you know, they're finding ways to gain the system and to gain us. You had a question. So you brought up Tool there. Um, I guess my question is, how can an artist and why would a record label allow them to opt out of streaming services that Tool has? A tool hasn't opted out. They are currently opting in, okay. uh, but they had a, the whole, th no, they just released the, their demo album on streaming last week. I wouldn't be surprised if you see the Opiates EP yeah. this week. Yeah. And I've actually plotted it out. If every week from now until August 31st, they put a new album out for streaming, they will have all their albums out for streaming by the time the new album comes out at the end of August. Um, they were wrapped up in a series of suits and countersuits that prevented them from actually being on streaming music services. The only guy that has really fought against it and won is Garth Brooks. And Garth Brooks, is the second highest selling artist in the history of humanity behind the Beatles. That's how powerful he is. And Garth Brooks fans will buy anything he does, and they want physical product, or they stream it through his website. He does not need the streaming music services, but he's the only one. So then if that's the case, why wouldn't all these other bands start their own streaming website services to get the royalties via that versus using Well, they're, they're trying. The, 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 the trick is, if you go to Wikipedia, and look up, uh, look up streaming music services and count the number of ones that are actually up in operation right now. There's probably 50 or 60, and a lot of them you've never heard of. The, the issue is one of negotiating rights. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say because who owns the, the publishing, who owns the copyright? If it's the artist, well, that's one thing. But if it's the record label or somebody else, that's another. And then that requires <coughs> complex negotiations. Yes? Um, how, how's oh, it going? Okay. Um, how, how has it changed uh, from finding artists today versus in the before? Like, people find artists and promote them, or has it changed where people can now just promote themselves and, and get across? Well, that's the problem. It's, it's hard to rise above the noise. Uh, one thing that record labels are very good at is marketing and promotion. That's why you need a record label, because they know how to get your music out there, and they know how to make more noise than the person next to you. Uh, and that's, it's just changed. Instead of you know making sure that you're on the cover of Rolling Stone or wrapped in front of a record store, you make sure that the song is uh, a song or the artist is included in a movie trailer or in a TV commercial or um, on a hot playlist like Rap Caviar on Spotify. It's just a different sort of thing. It, the challenge has always been the same. How do we become noticed in the midst of all this other competition? You had a question back there. 
<laughs> um, I'm listening to what you're saying and um, having read a lot of things because I'm just from a very young age. I wonder how much, uh, how important you think it is for artists to become better at business, quite frankly, because I think as an artist and, as, and speaking with colleagues who are also artists, there's a stigma around having business acumen of selling out but at the same time you mentioned Eagles and a big turnaround for their career was during the business, uh, during their high point that is. And um, there's a rapper named Immortal Technique who's never been signed to a record label. And he has had a consistent career for 20 plus years now. And he has done it exclusively on building his own audiences in his local area and then branching out. So there's lots of examples in hip hop. Like Chance the Rapper is another example. Yeah, so yeah. like what do you, what are your thoughts on what artists need to do to develop? There are some people that are very clever and very business savvy and have understood the power of things like SoundCloud and social media. And they have been able to cultivate an audience. First of all, they've got great music. That's number one. Number two, they're smart enough to learn how to use today's tools to promote that music. And maybe they've got uh, one or two people to you know, sort of help them in the back office uh, because you need to keep track of all these things. Ideally, you have a manager or an agent that takes care of the business end of things, just so you can focus on making music. But there are some people that are capable of doing both. But they're a rare breed. They really, really are. I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of really brilliant musicians who are useless as human beings. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I don't mean that, you know, terribly disparagingly. It's just that the, you, know, you know what creative types are like, right? They exist to create. They don't bother themselves with paying rent or figuring out how to shop for groceries. I can give you know, Joey Ramone, God bless Joey. <laughs> Wonderful guy, useless human being. He just, because he lived in a bubble and he had people to do these things for him because he was supposed to concentrate on being Joey Ramone and being a member of the Ramones. So he probably never ever wrote a check or had to pay a phone bill. Or, you know, John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, another guy. I mean, he was in the band when he was 17 years old. So he has always been a rock star. And he's never had to grow up because he was in this ultra famous band that was selling records by the tens of millions. And all anybody around him wanted him to do was to keep making music that would sell in the tens of millions. So not only did they protect him from all the mundane day-to-day -day stuff of being a human being, but they also encouraged any kind of bad behavior that they thought might help his creativity, which is why he went into the depths of heroin addiction. And it took him a lot of years to come out of that. I mean, he ended up having to have $90,000 worth of dental work done because the heroin completely rotted his teeth. Um, and I, I talked to John once, and you know, it was somewhere around end of the 90s, and I said, hey, John, how did you get that song, or how did you get that song, or that sound on that particular song? And he'd go, oh, yeah, man. <laughs> what? John, how did you get that sound on that track? I don't know, I just did it. You know, and that's the kind of, they can't articulate. Again, it's, this sounds really, really bad coming up, saying it out loud, but they can't articulate what they do, because that's the nature of art. You do what you feel. And, and a lot of these guys, this is why we need artists. Artists feel deeper than regular people. And not only do they feel deeper, but they are able to articulate that feeling through their art so that we feel it more deeply as well. And through that feeling, we, begin, we, we not only enjoy the art, but we learn more about ourselves. Does that make sense? And, you know, People who, who, who dismiss creative types as just being weird, yeah, maybe they are, but we need them. We desperately need them because they certainly make life a lot more interesting and they help us know ourselves a lot more than we would otherwise. Yes? So, uh, to bring it to your back catalog of ongoing history shows, mm -hmm. and you've brought a lot of them out to podcasts and all that, is there any chance that, that your catalog is deep and vast? Is there a chance of bringing them like some of the older stuff back? Yeah, we're actually podcast? we're actually working on that right now. It's a, what we have to do is we have to edit out all the music. And the reason we have to that's do that, it is, and that's a licensing situation. And I have been 
having conversations for the last six years with every performing rights organization under the sun, saying, look at it. Come up with a formula so we can pay you for the rights to distribute this music within these podcasts. And they go, oh, yeah, I guess you got a point. And then they just lose interest in it. <laughs> It does, it does kill the flow. Of it does. Yeah, it yeah, does. It's cool. you, you can tell your your dialogue and everything towards it is to introduce the song that you're about to do, and here's three seconds. Here's three seconds. I know, yeah. and we, we can't do anything about it. Yeah. And uh, at some point there is going to be what we need is a central clearinghouse so we can go to them and say, here's what we're going to do based on the number of downloads that we have. We are going to pay you a licensing fee. Much like we pay SOCAN or CMRA or Neighboring Rights or any of these other fees that we have to pay, we'll pay them. But instead of a broadcast uh, environment, we're going to make it in a podcast environment. Come up with something. And, oh, yeah, good idea. Yeah, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. We're here with a checkbook. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. And they just won't. You don't have any right, like, old radio station rights or anything like that? that Two different things. Is? Completely yeah, different I things. I wasn't sure whether you might have been tied in. The, the issue, no, the issue with, with radio is that you play music on the air uh, and you pay a fee for the privilege of doing that and it's with pre-tax, a percentage of your pre-tax revenues. So there are four different fees radio stations in Canada pay for the privilege of playing music as part of their business model. Fine. But that is amorphous stuff. It goes out into the air and it's gone. It's on its way to Jupiter. Uh, with a podcast, you are actually duplicating the song and distributing the song in its entirety, let's say, to other people. The record contract says that the record label has the exclusive right for distribution. So by putting songs in podcasts, we become a distributor. And the record labels will have none of that. So we have to figure out some sort of way of, of getting over that hump. That's, it's one of the distribution and the exclusivity that the labels have over music. So you brought up labels as being this black box stumbling block a few times. How long before they stopped being Never. there? No? Never. There's no way No, it, it looked like for a while that the internet would be this great leveler. Yeah. But it turned out that the record labels learned from their iTunes experience and decided that they were never, ever, ever going to lose control of distribution ever again. So when the streaming music services came along, they made sure that they kept them under their thumb. They made sure that they had an equity position in these, these companies so they could control how they work. It's, uh, it's just the way it's going to be. Artists are always, you know, it, it's like being a screenwriter. Uh, if you have a successful movie, the lowest performable is a screenwriter. You know, and everybody else makes the money except the guy who, or the woman who wrote the, uh, the script. You had another question. I got a, I got a feeling you got a follow up. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I mean, what we're all looking for is there are additional revenue streams that'll take the place of sales. That's what it comes down to. For, you know, since, since the Beatles, let's say, 1964, uh, that's the way musicians made the bulk of their money, was by selling pieces of plastic. Uh, that is no longer a viable revenue stream, so you have to find new ways of making money, like whether it be playing live, whether it be uh, what we call syncs, which is getting your song in a TV commercial or a movie or uh, a commercial. Um, or what else can you do? Um, merchandising, t-shirts, yeah. Patreon. Uh, yes, I mean there are some artists that, that have uh, like Patreon and uh, you know regularly occurring um, PayPal payments. It's it, we're going back to the 1950s and before where 
you had to be a working musician because that's where you made all your money. It's, been, it's only been the last 50, 60 years that we've gone to this pieces of plastic uh, model. Um, so we're kind of reverting to the way things used to be pre-1960, let's say. And uh, if anybody can figure out how these people can make money moving forward, um, you'll be rich, really. Yes? There's a couple of things too, you know, concept albums generally, I mean, if we talk about old school concept albums like The Wall or American Idiots or, you know, any of the classic concept albums that we've seen in the past, they take a very long time to make. They have to be, uh, to, for, for them to be um, enjoyed properly, you have to convince your audience to listen through from start to finish. And a lot of them are really complicated in the sense that you need a, a proper recording studio. And the time and money to be able to pull yourself up in a recording studio and experiment with sounds and approaches. A lot of recording studios are shutting down. And the reason is they're just too expensive to maintain. And there are, you know, even Abbey Road, the greatest recording studio in the world, has, a, um, has is, is also a school. They supplement their recording uh, revenues with teaching people how to be engineers and producers. And that never used to be the case. And there's a lot of there's metalworks in Toronto, for example. David Bowie and Prince and Tina Turner have used it, but now it's mostly a school. Um, and without those proper studios, with all the outboard gear and the special rooms and the special microphones and all that kind of stuff, it's really hard to make one of those really slick concept albums. Oh, you can still do one in your bedroom, but it's, it's not going to be the same. It really isn't. Um, we can talk about how s some of these concept album type songs fare on streaming music services. Uh, if you, you know, back in uh, the 90s, the average intro length for a song was about 17 or 18 seconds. Now it's five. So can you imagine, you know, a song like Pink Floyd's Money? Uh, how long does it take before the vocals come in? A lot longer than that. Oh, God, that song. It is a <laughs> long time. You know, and if you listen to, I'll give you another one. You uh, two where the streets have no name. You know how long it takes before the vocals come in? A minute and five seconds. You, you know, where, who's gonna, you know, you got this big cinematic opening with these synthesizers and, 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 and guitars uh, creating this wonderful sonic landscape. Uh, but I'm on Spotify and, no, I'm just kidding. Everybody gives a chance. One of the things that, that bothers me about streaming is that it's organized noise. There's no context to it. It goes in one ear and out the other. There is nobody there to take you by the hand and say, hey, listen to this, stupid. This is what you need to listen for. This is what the band is about. This is what the song is about. This is what the album is about. If they come from a certain scene, this is a certain sound. And if you know all these things and have all this context, well, then the music becomes more meaningful to you. And we're not doing that with streaming. This is why I think you know my program continues to be kind of popular is because we provide the, the context. Here's why this is important, dummy. Listen to it and you'll feel better as a result of it. You know, I'll give you another example. Nobody likes modern jazz the first time they hear it. It's just, it's just, it's just too complicated. You know, each of the players has a history. You have to know what they're trying to do with their improvisations. You have to know, you know, what the, the history of this music that uh, would lead to a, a sound and a, and, a, and a playing style like this. Um, what you need sometimes is repeated, unintentional exposure to a piece of music before the penny drops and you go, ah, I get it. And with something like modern jazz, you need somebody to take you by the hand and say, okay, I know this is weird, <laughs> don't be afraid. Here's how you're going to learn to enjoy it. And you don't have that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. We don't have the patience. You were patiently putting up your hand.
Okay, well, let's, yeah. let, let's, let's do that. The, the barrier to entry for global distribution of your art has never been lower. It is really, really easy when it comes to comparatively the way it used to be 20, 30 years ago when you needed a big corporation behind you with a recording studio and all the rest. You can do something really, really professional in your bedroom with your Mac. Yeah, or non-professional and that's still required. Yeah, still there, and there's, there's, there's YouTube, there's SoundCloud, there's uh, any number of social media outlets that will allow you to build a fan base that you would have never been able to do on your own in the pre-internet era, the pre-social media era. So yes, absolutely. The problem is A, Again, you know, how do you rise but above we're it? We're not talking about the problem. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about potentially, like, what is the problem? Because I think also as like an older demographic, I'm trying to see too, like, we don't like the change. It's going to be pushed back. But I also see it like a younger demographic that really is now wanting to consume now that fancy product, or there is a pushback against the problem. We'll see. It's the shift. Because we're kind of going like, we're coming from our perspective. Like, I understand what you're saying. Right. <laughs> uh, a lot of it is out of our hands uh, because music, tech, music is is always driven by the youth, and it's going to be up to people under the age right now of 25 to determine where music goes. Not only in terms of how it sounds, how it's produced, but how it's distributed and consumed. So it's you know. We, we will learn what we'll, we'll, we'll look back in, in 10 you know again we've only had streaming since really 2008 it's only been 11 years so we're really early into this and we, if we can go back to a hot, more than 100 years ago uh, in 1906 John Philip Sousa the guy who wrote all those great marches wrote an essay called wrote an essay called The Menace of Mechanical Music and he was dead against new technology, which allowed recorded music. He thought two things. Number one, you would, you would record a song and it would become frozen in amber forever and there would be no opportunity for that song to evolve over time. Secondly, if you could have a permanent recording of a song that you could listen to in the privacy of your own home at any time, that would prevent more people from becoming musicians and more people, it would prevent more people from taking music lessons so they could make music themselves. And he was the guy that invented the term canned music because an old Edison cylinder looked like a can. And uh, he was dead against this sort of stuff. Yet the people, the young people, the early adopters, proved him wrong. There were a lot of people who were on his side but it turned out that recorded music was one of the greatest inventions that we've ever had. We're in the same kind of situation with streaming music. We've changed the size of the container, we've changed the nature of the container, and we will not be able to see the result of this. Like, we really didn't see the result of canon music until the 1920s and the 1930s. So we may be in the same sort of situation now. I'll give you where, here's an example of some hope. Um, Spotify, again, does a lot of research, and they spent some time looking at the listening habits of users between the ages of 18 and 24, male and female, 18 and 24. And they tried to figure out what songs, what artists, these young people discovered that made them really, really excited. You know what the top three were? Number three was The Grateful Dead. Number two, was Tony Bennett, <laughs> probably through his association with Lady Gaga. And number one was Billie Holiday. When I teach at Humber College in Toronto, one of the first things I do is I ask everybody to take out their phones and to read me off the last 10 songs that they listened to. So it would be The Weeknd, Van Halen, ACDC, Lady Gaga, Cardi B, uh, The Rolling Stones. And if we all grew up, we had, that was our, a lot of that stuff would be our parents' music, right? We would never listen to older music because that was for the other generation. 
uh, and we were very tribal. If we were an alternative kid, we would stick with our alternative crowd. If we were a rocker, we would stick with our alternative, our, our rock crowd. If we were a pop fan, we would stay with our pop uh, audience. We would stay with our, our country music, whatever. Today's youth have absolutely no regard for era, genre, or anything that would otherwise create tribes. They might have a little bit of the preference, but they are listening to, as long as it's good music, and it doesn't matter from what era or what kind, as long as it's a good song, go listen to it. Now, if that is the source of my inspiration, my music education, a lot of these kids are gonna become musicians. And if that, if they go, if they can go from Billy Holiday and Tony Bennett to the Beatles to Van Halen to Eminem, and that all becomes part of their influence, what kind of music are they gonna end up making? This could be really, really, really exciting, but we won't find out for another five, 10, maybe 15 years. So as technology changes, the way we perceive art also changes. And right now we're in a transitory period, but we'll see what happens. Sure, let's have a bathroom break. Wonderful.